like there's no tomorrow. Hey! Hello, welcome everyone to the third book of the lecture number 10 of the financial engineering course. Uh, today we are going to finish this lecture with a subject of inflation. Uh, we will start with a little bit of history, uh, how the definition of inflation has developed over the last more than 100 years, and how uh, the, the perception of measuring and also perception of inflation has changed in our society. What are the techniques used to measure the inflation? and why inflation is something that it's not really comparable between different economies and also we cannot compare inflation in time. In the, in the two uh, follow-up blocks of two follow-up sections, uh, I will discuss pricing of derivatives, inflation derivatives. In particular, we'll be talking about inflation forwards, inflation swaps, and also I will show you how to price year-on-year -year inflation. So here will be quite some uh, uh, technicalities. Of course, this will be, everything will be in the spirit of a foreign exchange. I will show you the links between inflation, approach to model inflation, and also how it is linked to the modeling of foreign exchange. And finally, we will move to the summary of this lecture in homework. I have prefer, prepared three exercises, and I think that uh, uh, you will gain uh, quite some insight in pricing of a foreign exchange and inflation. Enjoy. Another topic that I would like to discuss in this lecture is the topic of inflation. Uh, inflation is also another asset classes, the one we still haven't discussed in this course, but now it's a good moment to also include this asset class, especially if we talk about uh, foreign exchange. As you will see, pricing of inflation derivatives is very much goes aligned with pricing of uh, foreign exchange. Typically, inflation products are included in many financial books like banks or pension funds because those derivatives typically allow for hedging of inflation risks. For many years, we haven't experienced worldwide high inflation uh, figures, maybe except for some uh, uh, countries uh, that the inflation was out of control. However, it is still, it seems that those derivatives uh, may be of more and more interest in the future. So let's take a look what actually definition of inflation is, because this is, I think this is, could be a surprise to, to many that definition of inflation has changed a lot over the last 100 years. So if you look at the definition from the Webster Dictionary from 1913, then this is the, 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 the copy of inflation. So inflation is the act or process of inflating or the state of being inflated uh, is with air or gas. And then we have a part which we are particularly interested in, we are, are interested in is undue expansion or increase from over issue set of currency. So initially, 100 years ago, inflation was not related to the price increases of the goods, typically that we always associate inflation, but it was purely defined in terms of monetary policy. So this meant at that time, inflation of money supply. So if central banks issued more money or printed more money and allow it to be in the economy, that was considered to be inflation. So this is something very much uh, to many surprising that uh, in the past, inflation was not really related to, uh, um, to, to, to goods, to prices, but it was related to money, money supply. Uh, so also there's another sentence here, one who favors an increased or very large issue of paper money. So this is, you see that nothing, nothing in this definition of a Webster dictionary says about the products and prices that we typically think of when we talk about inflation. Then if we look into 1971, so there's another, so let's see, there is a quite some 50 years after the first definition we have seen now in 1971, inflation the act of inflating, the state of being inflated, sharp increase in amount of money and credit causing advances in the price levels. So you see here now the, the perception has changed. It is linked in 1971. It is linked, the process of inflation, to also to, uh, uh, to price levels. So this means that initially it was only money supply that caused inflation to increase, that was measure of inflation. Now in 1971, uh, we have a price increase 
which is a result of a monetary supply or a financial supply of the money in the system. So you see that actually this developed uh, quite, uh, there's a huge difference in uh, what inflation actually is. And of course, these days, uh, the, the inflation is not anymore observed as the monetary um, process. So this means if central banks issue a lot of print, a lot of money, we don't officially use this quantity as the measure of inflation. Inflation will be only based on the consumer goods. So let's take a look at the, what are the consumer uh, indices, so the inflation measures that we currently use. And we have uh, two types. So we have uh, HICP, this is Harmonized Consumer Price Index. So this is the, the one that is referred to the uh, to European uh, Central Bank. And also we have a CPI index. This is the one which is used in the US. And those two indices, although when we talk about inflation, we can compare countries saying one country has higher or lower inflation, but this is exclamation mark. Uh, those measures, how inflation is calculated, is significantly varies per country. Therefore, those measures may not be necessarily equivalent. One country could have an official CPI index or inflation index at 3%, other could be 5%, but effectively, those numbers are not, uh, not straightforward to be compared because the composition of baskets and prices used to compare, they may be completely different. So it could be slightly misleading. The harmonized index of consumer prices so this is what I mentioned, differs from the US CPI in two primary aspects. So there are two main issues of a difference between the two um, inflation measures. The first thing is that uh, HICP attempts to incorporate rural consumers into the sample while US maintains a uh, survey, survey strictly based on the urban population. So you see that population of people who are used in the survey and calculations about prices increases it varies. So we have uh, either the, only the urban the population is taken into account or the whole population is taken into account. So that's the really uh, big difference on the first point. In the second, we have that HICP, so the European Index of Inflation, differs as, it, um, as the US excludes owner occupied housing from the scope. And so, so, secondly, the HICP also differs from the US as it excludes so called owner occupied housing from the scope. So, this means that in the US, CPI, the Consumer Price Index, includes the cost of rents of house in the uh, the mortgage in not sorry, not mortgage, but in a CPI index. However, in the in the US, in the Europe, these prices of rents are not included in the uh, in the CPI. So this means that if your rent increases fivefold, which is obviously you would consider this to be inflation, that may not be uh, reflected in. Uh, uh, CPI or inflation figures. So that could be there. You see those measures, how those inflations are measured could be sometimes quite controversial. And many people may say, look, we buy products in the market, we see prices increase. However, official figures are not really reflecting that. But this has to do with the measure, the way how those quantities are measured. So to mind those uh, CPI or the consumer price index, or this is the harmonized index of consumer prices, those are not really comparable uh, figures. And of course, this means that we should not be um, comparing countries saying that one country has significantly larger inflation than another one. If this is not uh, the, the, the way of uh, measuring those, those are not aligned measures. So this is the, the important element. However, uh, if we forget about the comparing different countries, we can use, still use the CPI index uh, to price derivatives because derivatives will uh, depend on the uh, outcome of the CPI index. So this is kind of interesting that although the definition of the CPI could change in time, the derivatives would be uh, anchored uh, to CPI index itself without changing, without taking into account the change of the definition of the index itself. I have prepared some uh, figures of uh, historical inflation developments or CPI developments in time. So this is the case for the US. This is the graph where we have an index CPI is always in a, uh, referred to some reference date because this inflation we always compare to some base date. And you can see here the index at 2000, 2015. So this is here. It is 100. So all the numbers are referring to this particular index 
reference the base, so-called base date. And this is also not seasonally adjusted, which is also something you want to see. So you see the inflation, the CPI index from here, we cannot really, okay, it is the reference to the base date. It doesn't really tell us more. However, if we look at the year-on-year -year inflation, this means if we compare uh, on a yearly basis the inflation figures, this is the graph what we see here. So here, for example, in 2020, 2021, we see year-on-year -year the significant change in inflation figures. Overall, the, the trend is slightly upwards. Uh, here, there's a period of the very low or deflationary uh, impact. You see here, this is when inflation goes uh, to minus, this is around minus 2%, and this is related to the market crash. So if there is a market crash, that's typically considered to be a deflationary uh, impact because people are not spending money. And then this also means that if company would like to acquire, sell some products, would need to offer some discount such that you would be willing to buy. And of course, any sort of discounts or decreases in prices, that is uh, deflationary because those prices are not increasing, but only decreasing, so that's the deflation. And after the shock of the crisis, then we see a slow increase in inflation. Now we also have deflationary part. Uh, this could be also related to the uh, economical performance. And so uh, globalization, this is also often the case where we are able to produce goods abroad. This means we can reduce our costs of production. That's also deflationary impact. However, we also see that there is some uptick um, in the inflation figures. Uh, let's see how this develops. It is unclear whether it's a trans transitory inflation or it will be so-called sticky inflation. Sticky inflation and uh, a transitory inflation, those are, um, there's a quite some difference between, important difference between the two. Sticky inflation is the inflation that you cannot simply uh, stop increasing. Because inflation, when we keep in mind, is that if this year we have inflation of 50%, let's say, and next year, to, to comp so from last year to this year, we have 50%. Next year from today, this year is zero. Then essentially we have, let's say, zero inflation. However, our prices have increased 50%. So we see that inflation, it doesn't tell you really about uh, how much you pay. It tells you only about increasing effect of the prices. And the sticky type of inflation essentially means that inflation will keep increasing in time. So that's a, that's a sticky inflation. And temporary inflation or transitory inflation would be the one that we have an increase in price, let's say by 51%, but then the prices do not increase. And that would be considered transitory. Transitory doesn't mean that the price will go down. It only means that increased happen of the inflation in one, one given period, then the prices didn't increase as much. But you see also the inflation can be very, um, it can be very uh, brutal, extreme. Uh, here we have also, this is the, 2930s, I think this is the crisis, very much deflationary in the market. Uh, here we have after the, the Second World War, uh, high inflation, lots of uh, money was printed to finance the, the war. Uh, then we have, of course, uh, this is the, the 70s and 80s, big inflation, and, uh, extreme monetary policy by central banks to stop this increase in inflation. So you see also inflation is nothing that is linear in growth. You see that, for example, here it was growing, went down, and then even went much higher. So the inflation phenomena is rather difficult to describe uh, by some simple economical models. I think until today there are some hypotheses. What are the main drivers of inflation? Yeah, but you can also see from the definitions of inflation, it changes over time. So it's not really cl completely clear what are the, the main factors that will influence the inflation? There are some, uh, um, let's say, hypotheses. What are the drivers? Obviously, this relation of inflation also has to do with the global economy, uh, the mindset of people, uh, aging of people, so the age of the whole population. This, all those factors, they play important role in, uh, in inflation figure, even if we have constant definition of the inflation. Uh, another thing is to keep in mind that those numbers here of inflation, the baskets that were used to uh, money to manipulate, sorry, to control or to measure the prices could be completely different than baskets constructed 20, 30, 40 years ago. So if you, for example, would measure the prices with the basket used in the past, it 
could also be that inflation is much higher. So this is something to be considered. This basket of wood that is used to monitor the inflation, it changes over time. Therefore, it is difficult to compare uh, one or two percent of inflation to the past. This is something to keep in mind. And of course, this also suggests that if central banks, they have a policy of keeping inflation at two percent. However, definition of inflation continuously changes depending on goods. Then that also means that this uh, policy is a little bit of maybe a floating policy because there is a little bit maybe of moving target in the monetary policy. This is an example of uh, a European Union. So this is CPI index. Again, 2015, we have the reference date of 100, the base date, and then we have the CPI index. And this is year on year inflation. So you see it's a European Union. It's, maybe, it's even down trend. So it's a deflationary, uh, not maybe spiral, but let's see how this develops. Now we are also here in the uptrend of the inflation. And let's see how the situation here would, uh, uh, would uh, what inflation, how it behaves in time. Here you see again 2008, 2008 prices, deflationary shock, and inflationary uh, increase, uh, mainly because of the recovery of the economy and monetary policy, a lot of stimulus, a lot of money used put to economy. Then we see uh, again deflationary impact. So you see it's, uh, it's very difficult to see exactly what are the main reasons we can see those shocks, like deflationary shocks, those are very easy to see. Also, overall, globally, it is a rather difficult task. So here is a, a basket that is uh, the US CPI, so it's um, uh, index. So this is an example of a composition of elements that are used in uh, um, inflation calculation. Here you can see the, uh, the, the changes and from month to month, so you can see from month to month how those prices in, uh, behaved. Uh, for example, here we are in 2021. This is kind of important. So fuel price increased a lot. Here we have energy in overall 23%. Here we have a used cars. You see 40% increase. And then also we have some deflation, deflationary forces, which is you know, associated here in the medical medical care. So this is minus 2%. But everything is rather significantly up. Uh, let's see how this also will uh, develop in time. So uh, some interesting points to keep in mind once we talk about inflation and how inflation is calculated. Uh, inflation measure itself is a subject uh, to adjust. So this means that there are some um, uh, techniques that are used to, let's say, smooth the results out or to uh, include also impact of uh, utility. And for example, the, the utility one is related to so-called hedonic effect. Uh, and of course, the first question you can ask yourself, if you have a new phone, you buy a new phone, this phone is different than the previous generation phones that you have bought. So the price that you will see is not necessarily reflecting only the inflation impact, but also it may represent the utility increase. So this means your new phone will have more megapixels, bigger screen, etc. So then the so-called hedonic effect is the, um, the effect that the process of extracting the utility of the price increase. So if your phone increase by uh, twofold, so 100% increase, however, you have uh, significantly more megapixels, your uh, camera is much better than uh, you have uh, a bigger screen. It could happen that if we apply the hedonic effect, then essentially the price didn't increase, but decreased. So that could be the, one of the possibilities to this, how, what is the impact of this hedonic effect subtractions. So utilities are uh, um, the, the utility of the tool that you buy, product that you buy can be extracted and could be reducing essentially the inflation impact of the price increase. Then we have a substitution. So then if uh, you have an increase in one good, then what we can also, the analyst, what they can do, this could say, okay, this good actually because it's only one good price has increased. This means that consumers will change from using this one to another one. So this means uh, that kind of also could say, if you are uh, buying um, a pork, let's say meat, and pork meat has increased, this would imply that uh, chicken, for example, stays the same. And the assumption would be that you would move to a chicken. And that would mean that the price actually hasn't increased for you because you have switched for something which is cheaper. And of course, this means that indeed there's no inflation with your quality of life has decreased. So that would be also not taken into account. 
And also another thing which is uh, substantial in terms of uh, uh, inflation measures is the how to take into account housing. So if you buy a house and house price increased, is that inflation or not? So in the in the US, mm -hmm. it is not taken into account the housing itself because house is considered to be investment. It's your capital. So this is not inflationary. However, you have also, we have a so-called shelter impact. This means that your, uh, that means that the price of living in a house, uh, it is, would be somehow included in, uh, in CPI or inflation measures. And so this means how, how it goes for an only occupied unit. The cost of shelter is the impact rent that owner occupants would need to pay if they were renting their homes. So essentially, this measure is based on kids. Uh, many people who are having bought their house, they are asked, what will be your rent if, if you were just renting your own apartment from somebody else? And based on the results of the questionnaires, on those questionnaires, then the estimate of the shelter impact of the cost of rent is included in CPI. So you see there is some kind of bias and also delay before CPI will show us the figure of the price increases related to the housing or shelter. And also there's something uh, we have already discussed that um, the basket of products used for inflation calculations for inflation calculations varies in time. So it, those inflation numbers are not really comparable to each other. And then we have a, a CPI index is uh, often considered to be the lagging indicator of inflation. However, for derivative pricing, we use it as the underlying uh, observable. Uh, quantity, uh, but in uh, in practice it is lagging. So you may have increase in prices. However, inflation will not show you that. And uh, what often people refer to is that if you are interested more in a reliable, reliable measure of inflation, then the price of commodities is more suitable for that because it represents supply and demand in the market that could be closely related to uh, commodity uh, to the inflation than actually the CPI index which is highly, um, uh, very much uh, complicated and also um, relies on very much of subjective uh, approaches. The modeling of inflation is very much alike as we have done it for foreign exchange. This means that in foreign exchange, we were modeling the foreign FX process or FX variable as the one which exchanges money from one currency, so let's say foreign, to domestic currency. In terms of inflation, so if we apply the same strategy to inflation, we can think that inflation exchanges the amounts between nominal values and real values. And the difference between the two is actually the inflation compensation uh, for, the, uh, for the inflation phenomena that we observe by looking at the CPI index. So this is the point number two. There is a strong relation between, from the modeling perspective, between foreign exchange and also the, the inflation approach to inflation. So this, those approaches are very much alike. This is why I have decided to include the inflation subject by the, uh, the foreign exchange. Um, who is the client of, pension, of, the, of the inflation products? Mainly those are pension funds, insurance, company, insurance companies, and banks that deal with these inflation-dependent derivatives. Uh, pension funds, for example, interested in the conditional future indexation of pension rates, which can be viewed as an exotic derivative depending on the inflation level. So as you can imagine, the inflation, especially if you promise, if your pension is related to the future promises regarding your payments, uh, inflation impact may be significant. Of course, in a period of deflation, when we the money gains value, the purchasing power, and that's not really a problem. However, if your purchasing power deteriorates in time, then the hedging using inflation products could be very desirable. And this is what typically what pension funds are, are doing. And there is also an uh, important point is there is a connection between nominal and real interest rates. Uh, and that's also related to the break even inflation rate. The breaking inflation rate is the, the spread between nominal and inflation link bonds. So this is what uh, people typically look. They look at the market expectation regarding the what are the uh, inflation linked bonds, where they are quoted, and what is the yield uh, for a nominal yield. So if you have a yield curve, that's a nominal yield curve. And the difference between the two tells you about the break even points 
and the world of the spreads between the two. So keep in mind that before we have discussed if a building of a yield curve, multi curves, etc., those curves, those in those uh, instruments are considered to be nominal uh, nominal instruments as they they are not uh, compensated. The inflation factor is not taken into account. So this means that if you see prices in the market, those will be considered always nominal because they don't protect you against the inflationary forces. So this means that your purchasing power could also decrease in time, although you pay, uh, although your value, let's say the, the nominal value is seen in the market increases, your purchasing power decreases. So there is this inflation effect that connects the real economy and the nominal economy. And of course, inflation swaps are the products or inflation front, uh, forwards are the products that will expose you to the difference between the real and also the nominal economies. And that will be essentially the product that you want to use in your hedging strategy. So this is typically the, the first, the basic uh, contract is the inflation swap, where we exchange the performances. You can see here, the, if this is the CPI index, it's I at time T. And then we also have this uh, base date T0, this, because we always compare uh, to something. So uh, this portion here, and then this is the floating part, because this is stochastic, because we don't know what the inflation will be in the future. And then we have a fixed part. So we pay a fixed amount. So we have a stripe K here, and this is the floating part. So you see there is a swap of exchanging two flows, the floating part and the fixed flow. And of course, um, the, if we equal it to zero, and we find what is the strike here, in this case, that will the fixed rate here, then we will see also the market expectation regarding the inflation uh, in the future. So this will be the, the amount of money implied from the, the implied, implied amount of inflation implied from the market instrument. So this is very simple. You see that we have a notional, of course, and depending on the increasing or decreasing inflation, then this amount will be positive or negative. And so if we have a, if we bought this contract, um, then if the inflation increases, of course, this will be larger than a fixed amount we pay uh, at the end. So this is the nominal part, and this is the inflation, let's say, uh, factor. And then we have to multiply with the, the notional that we are having in our contract. So you see, it's very straightforward, this approach. Uh, important part is always have this, uh, we always have this uh, base date. Of course, this is fixed in the past or known before. Uh, however, also we could have a year-on-year -year inflation. I will also show you one slide where we have an inflation time Ti, and then we, we observe it inflation at time Ti minus 1. So we look at this year-on-year -year inflation, but in the future. So those dates are not today. Those are in the future dates. This is also a possibility for inflation product, and that's called year-on-year -year inflation. But later I will show you more uh, details on that. There are a few takes away, so to take takeaways regarding the inflation. The first one is that uh, inflation is quoted on a monthly basis. Therefore, if you have a payoff as such, and those, let's say, dates of a payment dates that take place, you may be exposed also to interpolation between the different CPI indices. So this is what you have to take into account. And uh, typically also um, inflation indices are interpreted, are often interpolated linearly or piecewise constant. And that depends, that interpolation depends on particular market uh, market settings. So whether it's a euro or GBP or USD, there's a different uh, methodology regarding how to calculate inflation if you have inflation in the middle of the month. Is it for inflation from the previous month or inflation from the next month, if it's known, or you interpolate in between. So that's very much uh, specific depending on the market you are pricing your inflation product. Uh, this is another thing that you have to keep in mind that inflation is always delayed in X. So this month, if you have uh, inflation information, this quote that we will see today, it could be for a month uh, which is in the past. And today's quote for this month inflation will be released in the future. So you have to be very careful uh, to which date, at what point, this inflation index is known. Especially in the modeling, you have to be very careful about those delays because those are very important because those actually can tell you that you're looking at the wrong inflation index if you price a derivative. So you have to always keep in mind 
what is the delay between inflation figure and inflation release of those figures. So, for example, uh, inflation for June, it will be, for example, released in September. It always takes a while uh, before the analysts, the statisticians, will um, calculate the inflation uh, for a particular month in the past. This is why the approach of looking at the commodities, it's uh, considered to be it's a better representative for the inflation because in commodity prices we can see immediately every day in the market. However, inflation, there is, uh, let's say, some processing process involved. And then we have those uh, even a few months of delays regarding the inflation figures. The last point here is that we have those uh, exchanges between nominal and real economies. And that's the, the function of inflation, which is very similar to the foreign exchange. So um, I'm not going to derive you the forward inflation, but if you follow the same strategy we have done it for the foreign exchange, you will see that forward inflation is simply inflation as seen at time t, and then we have the, the zero coupon bonds uh, implied so from real economy and nominal economy. Of course, nominal zero coupon bonds, so this one, it is easy to get because this will be your uh, zero coupon bond from your yield curve. Uh, but the question will be how to get this zero coupon bond. And actually, if you have forward inflation available in the market, you have this zero coupon bond, nominal zero coupon bond from your yield curve, you know the inflation today, then of course you can always calculate what is the zero coupon bond in your real economy. So this real zero coupon bond or real yield will be implied from the nominal yield and the forward for your inflation. Then you can find out what is your real, uh, your real yield from a a real curve, which is inflation adjusted. So if you look from the pricing perspective, so here we have it, this is only a payoff. Also, this is a payoff. We still have to discount and this value to today using our nominal curve. So what we do, we have a, a Q is a risk neutral measure. It's a nominal. And we discount this payoff from time T until today. So we discount from time T to today. We first step would be to change the measure from the risk neutral measure nominal to the nominal zero coupon bond. So this is what we do here. And of course, now we see that a lot of things are deterministic. So this is deterministic. Also this A over uh, the, the inflation at T0 is known because we are at T0. So then we only end up with expectation under the T forward measure, nominal T forward measure. And this, we can use this definition here. And this means that we have this uh, forward inflation forward at time t this should be t zero to capital time t so this is i will fix it in the slide so it's inflation f t zero capital time t so you see this is essentially how we would value our swap inflation swap so it's, it's very straightforward because if we have inflation forwards immediately we can price inflation swap so this is very much uh, very much simple and this is what we already have seen for foreign exchange and also for interest rate swaps. So if you connect those two uh, methodologies, you can also price inflation swaps. And this is uh, um, something related to the uh, how we can uh, uh, use at the relation between real and nominal, uh, real and nominal zero coupon bonds. So if we value the swap equal to zero, so this is typically what we also do, so-called par pricing of a swap. And we use also then, uh, so if we choose this to zero, this will be essentially we can divide it out. So then we have uh, inflation forward is equal to inflation uh, at time t zero. And then we have this uh, multiplier, the, the, let's say the adjustment for the, for the inflation part. So this is because we choose this to zero, then this would has to be equal such that this will hold. And then of course, if we also use the definition of the forward, then we can arrive at the relation between zero coupon bonds, so the nominal and real, and also this compensation factor that allows us to switch, to alternate from the nominal economy to the real economy. But this is also what we have seen in the previous slide, how this is related to the real and nominal economies. In the last part of this lecture, I would like to discuss some details regarding pricing of options using inflation processes. So, it's similar, we had it for foreign exchange. Um, we also can define uh, hybrid models for inflation. 
where also the dynamics of those processes. So here we have a Black Scholes extended with stochastic interest rates. So we have a two times whole white model for a nominal and real rates. We see those processes, the system of SDEs looks very much alike what we have seen already for the, for the foreign exchange. And also we have this uh, correction term, which comes from this uh, martingality assumption when we transfer funds from one economy, from the nominal economy to the real economy. And uh, actually it's, this is the opposite. We, we, our measure here is the uh, risk neutral measure. That's actually called nominal measure. So our assets, or all the products, financial products we price, it's always a nominal risk neutral measure because it's the, the value that we see nominal value in the market. This means also we have this correction as we had for the foreign exchange. So it's very much alike. You see the difference between nominal and real rates, uh, just as we had it for the FX, where we had a domestic and foreign exchange to the processes in two different economies. So what are the derivatives? We could have, for example, taps and floors. So exactly the same as we would have it for in the interest rate world or FX world. So here we have an option, a call option, where uh, we talk, we look at the inflation performance with respect to the base date. And then we have a strike, which is uh, it's not just carry with force, but this whole amount we can define it as K star. So it is just like a European uh, call option. And then this, this amount is constant. So we can, of course, take it outside. We can redefine this K star. So be just standard European option you have already seen before. And we have discounting with the nominal money savings account at time capital time T. So you see, this is the standard uh, product. And we, price, we can price it as we have done it using the uh, foreign exchange uh, methodologies. And the, the second part, which is also the second payoff that I would like to mention, is the year-on-year -year inflation. So in the previous one, we talk about zero type of uh, zero, uh, zero uh, base case. So this means we are always have one fixed date, which is already in the past. So then we talk about a zero coupon kind of inflation. This base is known. We can also have a, a year on year. Then we are talking about the performance of inflation over period of time. So we, here we are looking at a, what is the inflation at time TK compared to TK minus one. And of course, our perspective is today T0. We are time T0. This means that this quantity is unknown, but also this quantity is unknown because this is unknown in the future. So if we have time, time t0 here, we will have a tk minus 1. Here we have a tk. We look at deflation at this point. At this point, we look at the ratio between the two. And this is something we already have discussed also in the computational finance course, where we talk about uh, uh, forward start options or the performances uh, options, options with performance. Uh, what we can do here, similarly, first step is always if we have stochastic discounting, uh, remove the discounting, move to the uh, forward measure. So we have a nominal uh, forward measure with a payment at time TK. And then we have to find out the, the this, oh, this is measure forward TK measure. We have to find out the distribution for those uh, inflations at time TK divided by TK minus one. So this is the, the quantity of interest. In the case of log normal case, where we will have only uh, geometric Banyan motion for inflation. So assuming we have the real nominal rates to be uh, constant, then of course, this doesn't really change our log normality assumption because the ratio of two uh, log normals is still log normal, except then the, the distribution of this quantity would not depend anymore on the initial. This is kind of take away uh, from the forward start option approach. So this means that if we have a black Scholes case, so in black Scholes case, we have inflation T, T we have uh, uh, nominal minus R real, we have inflation plus T here, DT plus sigma I T D W T. And then if we are looking at the ratio of T A divided by inflation T K minus one, then the, you know, also the solution here will be inflation at time T0 times E. Then we have second, sorry, in the denominator, we would have for inflation at time T0 times E. 
So you see, essentially, this kind of quantity does not depend on the initial, because those initial will cancel out if you just substitute. And however, it will depend on the volatility between periods Tk minus one and Tk. So this is this is the the important part that uh, part that actually determines the value of this option. So if we substitute now, we also know, okay, so those are the CPI indices. We also know the forward rate, and the definition was given in the previous slide. So we can find out what is the inflation CPI, and we can substitute in these two terms here. And this is what the terms will arrive. Of course, the inflation in this case, because we are looking at a TK here, TK, TK, TK. Uh, and of course, valuation of inflation forward TK, TK is simply equal to inflation at MTK. So you see the zero coupon bonds, this zero coupon bonds, they, they are equal to one, doesn't really matter. So then this means this part, we only have uh, inflation forward, and then we have inflation forward with those zero coupon bonds. If you collect those terms together, this is the expression we arrived at. Of course, now is the key point is, okay, we need to still find this distribution for this quantity, and uh, this distribution has to be under this measure. However, from this perspective, we already, if we are dealing those forwards, we know that those forwards under TK measure of martingales, this is exactly how we had it also for FX work. So next step would be to Define a new variable x tk minus one tk. We take this expression from max uh, under the maximum sign, so this will be this expression here, and we would like to derive the the distribution for it. So what we can do, um, similarly in more generic case, in any generic case, we can find we can find out the the characteristic function for this process under the log transformation. So first, what we do, we take the log transformation, then we end up with uh, a very nice collection of terms, the log of uh, IF, uh, IF at different points. Here we have a zero coupon bonds. And then if we just use the definition of the characteristic function, we should be able to find a characteristic function for this, uh, uh, for this log of XT. And then we can use the pricing machinery using the Fourier transformation uh, for this particular option, actually this option here. So using the Fourier, we can do it even if you would have a more complicated model, for example, Hester model, assuming even constant interest rates. Also, we can do it using a, a type of Black-Scholes case. Uh, of course, this case is Fourier because we can use it in much more generic sense. We can use it for different models. Uh, but in case of Black-Scholes who white, we should be also able to derive those inflations or those year-on-year -year inflations analytically. That's not a, not a big problem. It's a little bit of an algebraic expression. Here, if you're interested how to derive this classic function, I recommend you to revisit lecture number 12 from the computational finance course, where I have uh, dedicated some time on how exactly step-by-step -step derive those forward um, characteristic uh, functions. And those can be used for pricing of forward start options, which is equivalent to a year-on-year -year inflation option. Now is the time to summarize what we have learned in today's extensive lecture. Uh, we had three blocks in which we have covered um, two important asset classes, foreign exchange and also inflation. In both asset classes, um, we have found first some similarity between the two, that inflation approach for pricing of inflation products and also cross-currency, uh, those are very much alike. So from the um, technicalities, uh, those are coming to the same category of models, so we can use the same machinery if we talk about the pricing of swaps and also pricing of European type of options. Pricing of options is in particular very important because if you have a, a model described with stochastic differential equations, then in order to find parameters, the volatility parameters, we need to calibrate those to market instruments and market instruments that are used to calibrate volatility parameters, those need to be options. This, this means that uh, knowing how to price an option, it is uh, uh, very important and fundamental, uh, because otherwise we are not able to find optimal parameters. A simulation of stochastic differential equations and also pricing of derivatives, um, this is our ultimate goal, because um, at the end of this course, we would like to 
price portfolio and evaluate uh, future exposures of a portfolio. And then we can apply measures like VAR calculations and also um, XVA. So this simulation part of processes and also understanding what is the relation between derivatives in the market and also coefficients, parameters of the model, it is very important because this is actually our main goal of this course. So let's take a look what we have uh, what we have achieved in this lecture. Uh, we had three blocks uh, where we discussed the foreign exchange. I tell I have told you how to have described how to evaluate FX forward. So what is the financing strategy we can uh, uh, we can uh, derive? We can approach such that we can find out what is the fair value uh, of the FX contract where we exchange flows between two different currencies, so domestic and foreign currency. And that leads us to a fair value of a FX uh, contract, so FX forward. Next step, once we know how to derive FX forward, next approach, next step was to derive fair value of a cross currency swap, where we have a, where we exchange the node flows in the inception, and then we have uh, flows from uh, different currencies. And of course, the objective is to find what is the fair value of such a, such a contract. Uh, next step was using the Black Scholes case, so simplified case where we don't have stochastic interest rates. How to price FX options? Those options will be also, of course, uh, used to calibrate the parameters from the Black Scholes model. And the next step was to extend the pricing of FX options, uh, extend it with uh, stochastic volatility and also stochastic interest rates. So these were uh, two blocks here. Uh, the next part of the uh, the, let's say the, the next asset class discussed in this lecture was the subject of uh, inflation, where I have uh, presented how to define inflation forwards, so how to price inflation swaps. Then, as the final goal, we discussed two derivatives in the interest in the inflation world: the pricing of European type of options on uh, inflation, and also on the CPI, and also pricing of year-on-year -year inflation swaps where we look at the performance of the inflation in the future. And that is related to the forward start forward start options. Now is the time to, to summarize our course. So the summary is, uh, uh, is, is let's say, it's done. Uh, now let's go to discussion of the home. So for today, I have pre prepared three exercises. Uh, the first one is to finalize the derivations we have done at the end of the course, where the characteristic function for year-on-year -year inflation was given. So maybe you remember, I have presented what is the characteristic function, the definition of the characteristic function for year-on-year -year log of x. So what you have to do, you have to substitute all those terms to this uh, uh, expectation and see uh, what can you actually derive this classic function in the case of the black scholes whole white case. Of course, you'll be able to derive it because I did it. So um, the, the task is to derive this classic function uh, for year-on-year -year, given the black scholes full white case. And of course, the second step would be to implement cost methods to recover the prices for multiple strikes and compare your results with Monte Carlo. As the second step is the discussion about uh, uh, Heston Hull White, what type of uh, approximations, what kind of uh, problems you have encountered if you move from the black scholes full white to Heston stochastic volatility. So this is exercise number one. Exercise number two, it's a little bit also technical one. So before was simulation. Here we also do some simulation, but we also have to find some approximations. In financial engineering world, you always encounter some approximations. And reality is never as ideal as our models on, on paper. So here the objective is that if we have a stochastic differential given, stochastic differential equations of this form, uh, we would like to find the, uh, the expectation of this fall uh, option. So it's under money payoff, and we need to find out the expectations of function g, which is given in this form. So this is what you have to prove. And at the end, um, the objective is to uh, use Monte Carlo simulation and then compare it to the analytical expression that we have here. So here we have expectations of the y, uh, t1, uh, ti, ti minus 1, expectations of function gx, and then those expressions. So your objective would be here to uh, calculate these expectations with Monte Carlo, and then numerically integrate these quantities and see whether you are, uh, whether everything uh, is nicely aligned. 
So this is a little bit of, uh, uh, let's say, not algebra, but it's kind of nice theoretical exercise where you can check your uh, derivation skills. And the third assignment, so those two assignments actually coming from the book, uh, and then this, this one, it's a combination of the two exercises, 15.6 and 15.7. We have a, a stochastic differential equation. This is also what we already have seen for the foreign exchange. And your objective is to represent this SDE in a simplified form of this term. This, this, this is the form that you have to ar uh, arrive at. So you have to factorize all these Brownian motions to arrive at sigma hat. So your task is to find the sigma uh, sigma, sigma hat uh, term. So I hope you have enjoyed this course and also the exercises. And we see each other next time. Bye-bye.